all right. What's good, people? Hope everybody's well. Let's go on here. Just a little bit. All right, we're almost there, people. We're almost there. Just getting the kinks out. There we go. All right. Let me know. Give me a one if you can hear me clearly. Um, just make sure everything is good this time before I, I dive in and I ain't listen the whole time and my, my sound is off. So give me a one if you guys can hear me clearly. There's no interference. Thank you, Dante. Appreciate that. Well, welcome back to the Onyx Report. Black Masculine's news for the day. Good to see the brothers in here. Thank you for uh, letting me know. Shout out to poor man. Appreciate that, King. Ghetto user. Thanks for the heads up. Let me start out by saying like, share, subscribe, join, and donate so we can continue to bring you independent black male thought. So please make sure you are doing that. Shout out to all of you. Let me see. And right out the gate, let me give a shout out to, to Barry. Appreciate that donation. It says first like, first super chat. Support your scholars. Support your channel. Uh, support independent black male media. That's right. That's what's up. So appreciate that. What's up, Urban Naturalist? Um, Barry in the house dropping information about the show. Much appreciated. Jagu Archery. Jagu Archery. <laughs> shout out to you. I got to get back to the, the shooting range, man. I ain't hit the range in a minute with uh with guns or with my bow so i need to get back in there but anyway shout out to all of you what's up prince we got ron in here c j jackson what's up uh andre in the house saint seer king i'm listening passport og in the house y'all make sure you support passport og support the channel check him out he's doing some some great work uh caught the one uh today thought it was great so shout out to you what's up toya See you there. Project Pain, what's up? Ter Terrell, what's going on? Uh, Dante, poor man's passport guy, ghetto user. You know what I'm saying? Sincere. Appreciate the support. Dante with the super chat. You know what I'm saying? Um, and in case I missed it, it looks like Urban Naturalist gifted a membership to the channel. Shout out to you for that. Uh, shout out to Sincere. Peace and good health, health to you, dog. Thank you for all you do. Appreciate that support. Thank you. Um, uh oh, that we got Joe Herb in the house. What's up? Yeah, what's up? Spain man, good to see you. We're getting it going. Um, all right, BGS in the house. Shout out to BGS. I was gonna call you in on this one, man, but I knew you, I saw you grinding today. I'm not gonna bother you, but I hope you're well, good brother. Um, so yeah, so, um, y'all know the deal. Donate, make sure you do. I'm, I'm not going to say it elsewhere in the show. So I try to get it out in the beginning. So y'all know what it is. Also, uh, make sure that you have picked up the book, right? Solutions for Anti-Black Misandry, Flat Blackness and Black Male Death. Uh, you can get that on Amazon, on Rutledge, the whole deal. Make sure you pick that up. Right? Um, I just like to make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, make sure you subscribe help the channel we're trying to get to our 50,000 subscriber goal so we are uh still chugging away so please make sure you've done that what's up dead set brother chris what's up LaShawn? uh ghetto user for the support uh oh support in the trade appreciate that what's up trey what's up um yeah so we're getting that done i want to also acknowledge uh, some donations between streams um so shout out to kiel for the cash app rod uh appreciate that shout out to you shout out to david smith for two very generous cash apps uh in between shows so i wanted to say thank you for that um as well as uh let's see here dark power yeah so thank you all for that much appreciated um so let's get it in here we're gonna what i wanted to do there's a couple of um interviews that Nick Cannon did with Ayanna Van Zant, And I will probably do both, but at least today, I kind of wanted to just deal with one of them. Um, and so I see a lot of people reacting, you know, we've seen this last few years, reacting to other videos. 
but I think there's there's other ways to deal with it too. There's we can engage, we can respond uh, instead of just reacting, you know. So today I'm going to engage. You know, I, I watched clips of it. I haven't seen the whole thing back to back, but I wanted to engage. And I mean to say that because there were some things that I heard um, coming from Nick that I thought were were problematic. I heard some things from uh, Ayala that I liked. So um, you know, we're going to go back and forth and deal with what comes. Shout out to Wrench Turner. Appreciate that, man. Good to see you in here. I'll support the Wrench Turner uh, channel here on YouTube. Salute to you as well. It says a uh, hashtag blackmail ad advocacy tax. <laughs> Appreciate that. That's what's up. And that's how we need to support one another. You know, I often try to go to others' channels and, and just at least pop my head in, you know, try to give some kind of, uh, you know, support because, uh, you know, it's, it's not a guarantee that channels uh, can take off. But we got to support best we can. Subscribe. Let other people know about it, so on and so forth. So anyway, um, but before we delve into Nick Cannon and uh, Ayanna Van Zandt, there is a short, you know, you know, kind of public service announcement, if you will, for a video I thought was interesting that uh, kind of puts in context where we are in many respects, at least in my humble opinion. Um, so I ran across this today on Twitter. This was actually something that uh, Dr. Tommy Curry was responding to and he was basically saying this is what it means to be a black man in america so um i wanted to show it because in all the things we talk about all the things we deal with especially in regard to the gynocracy uh in regard to how black men are treated intra communally and you know in terms of race um i want us to remember that on the you know in terms of our interactions with the larger public some things haven't changed so check out what i mean uh, this is about three minutes. I'm going to play the whole thing. I may, you know, comment here or there, but I ultimately wanted you to see this if you hadn't to let you know that it ain't shit change. Here we go. Stand silent. Go. Roll down, roll down high. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. I see that. Um, I'm um, just, just working work right over there. Is everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. Is everything all right? I just, I we were noticing inside that you guys have been parked here. Oh, yeah. For like 15, like 15 20, 20 minutes? minutes? Yeah, oh, yeah, we're at lunch. lunch. Yo, yo, we work, we work there. Oh, where right, are you right, working? Right, right here. Where? Where? Right, right. And, 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 and did you see the same thing? In like, like, like a really expense. 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 You guys are saying there's an echo in the clip. All right, let me check the audio. See what I could do about that. Echo cancellation. And, um, let's see. So tell me if this is any better. Any echo in that? Was that any better? I'll wait until somebody gives me some information about it. Okay. So I'm starting to see a one. So I'm hoping that means that uh, all is well. The echo is gone. Um, yeah, somebody said better. Okay, echo. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's check it out. So let's continue. So I'll back it up a little bit. 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, I've heard, you know, every time I play a clip, people are always like, that's a skit. Here's my thing. I keep having to say this. I don't care because a lot of these situations I've actually experienced directly. So I'm, I'm showing you this because this is the reality of black male life, not necessarily because something it may or may not be a skit. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. I've, I've had this experience several times, so this is not new. Um, so here you go have the papers for it and stuff Sir, why it's really you... expensive it doesn't Sir? seem like you guys can afford it i'm about to step up i'm about to step up bro i just i'm about to step up what is your uh, issue with well, this it's not my issue don't really. touch my, my car it's my don't customers my car, and stuff i just like um are just worried because it's very suspicious behavior bro. and suspicious they're just worried behavior. That we're chilling bro get your hands out bro don't touch my car okay well i'm not i'm not gonna tell you again okay please don't holler i'm not gonna tell you again don't touch first of all you are being very threatening right now. Okay? I do not feel safe. <laughs> they started laughing the same time I did. <laughs> now I'm laughing because it was it was an interesting flip. It was like jujitsu jujitsu right there. They just flipped that whole situation. But you know, or he did. But here's the thing. We both know, we all know, I should say, that white tears, <laughs> whether female or male, can get you in all kinds of trouble. So you know, it, it, it isn't to be laughed at in terms that, you know, in terms of whether or not you can end up getting locked up behind some bullshit. But it is to say the reversal was. was I stole and the switch was real, too. But anyway, um, yeah. Right. 
That's that black male privilege that we hear a lot about in the academy, by the way. But shit's real, right? And y'all, and many of you, if you're regular listeners, y'all, y'all are generally the kind of brothers that have experienced something like this, or you know somebody that has, right? So basically, your whole um, well-being can be disrupted to the point where you can end up locked up or killed simply because you were sitting in a car, right? They assumed they were casing. They call, he called them threatening, all this kind of jazz. And all they were doing was sitting there talking. And my impression is they were just starting a job nearby, right? That's enough. So in, in, in all the things we talk about, especially in our criticisms of, of feminism, the role of the state, uh, you know, kind of a misandric kind of policy and treatment that we deal with within families, within relationships, don't get it twisted. I will, I will definitely be here to remind us that this is not changed in the larger society in mainstream uh, society. It's still the same business as it was in our fathers and our, our grandfather's generations. This shit hasn't changed. We're still perceived to be dangerous right? to the point where you got to wonder about your life behind somebody else's fear. This is one of the things that I had to teach my son. And that was always difficult to get people to get him to understand about people. He never got it. Well, I won't say that. It took him a long time to really get it. Because he didn't see himself as a threat. So he didn't understand why anybody else would. But that's the that's the goal. And that's, uh, especially our young men to understand how they're perceived. I just wanted to share that with you. That shit's real. And it still goes on. So that said. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to play um, the, the, the entire interview, really. And I'll stop the comment. I have it set up to where it's just going to show images. It's not going to show the video for copyright purposes. So uh, just letting you guys know that up front and um, we'll kind of I'll kind of start at a couple minutes in. But uh, shout out to Guy. It's going to be real dudes like that. Try to holler at us on dating sites. I bet you he's not that scared. Okay. Whether he's acting or not, you know, just and, and that's kind of the, the danger of it. It's not even really a matter of whether or not he's acting. The fact that he can. That people can act you into the grave. And turn around and walk away like nothing happened. Or whatever their reasons may be. Right? Or whatever their reasons may be. Um, I'm not proposing that that was honest or dishonest. Fact is, it can happen simply because somebody decides it should happen. But anyway, so let me bring this up. Again, uh, it is an honor, privilege, and a pleasure. Uh, to. I'm going to skip ahead, you know, like a couple minutes in. But we're going to go through... Um, you know, majority of this. So this is an interview that took place. I want to say about a month ago. I think it came out. I was just, I just, I had a couple of brothers send it to me. So I just decided to finally kind of take a look at it. And I understand that there are two uh, videos. So like I said, I'll probably cover the second one uh, a little bit later, but uh, we're just going to jump into this and I'll just kind of comment here and there on some of the things I heard um, that took place. Now, you know, all of us are familiar for the most part, but if you're not, Nick Cannon is uh, known to be a quasi actor, comedian, at one point rapper, whatnot. Um, I've enjoyed some of his films. I'm not, you know, I'm not a super duper fan, of course. And, and you know, he's been in the news the last few years because I believe he has over 10 kids uh, with uh, almost as many women or something of that matter. So he's, you know, kind of known for that at this point, as well as anything else, as far as his career is concerned. Ayanla uh, is principally known for launching on, um, excuse me, on the Oprah Winfrey channel. And she's had several uh, shows that I know of. She's done a lot of radio. She's done a lot of different projects. And, you know, she's been known as, uh, especially during the 80s and 90s, as, you know, kind of one of the Oprah era black women talking about relationships, talking about wellness, uh, spirituality, so on and so forth. In the last number of years, what she's kind of, you know, been known for is kind of having a pivot, right? She had a, she had a sort of a pivot in her approach where she began to become very critical of black women, which is something that, you know, many of us didn't see, didn't really see coming. I can't say it made her popular in the Oprah crowd. I, I think there were some women that were, you know, quite offended that she kind of pivoted in that fashion. Um, you know, she may have disappeared for a little bit at one point. But uh, she's, you know, she's kind of come back in here and there and she's made comments that we've seen go somewhat viral. 
um, over this last uh, year or so. And, you know, she's kind of t- taken a position where she may equally critique black men or women at any given point. But uh, the last kind of major shift that she had is when she identified that black women were out of pocket. And this was not something people saw coming. So she was kind of aligning, whether outspokenly or not, with uh, people like Shahrazad Ali, uh, even though we know in that infamous Phil Donahue clip where she was on the show back in the 80s, uh, very you know hostile to Shahrazad Ali. And so she kind of came full circle in her, her criticism of black women's culture, behavior, so on and so forth. So in this clip, um, you know, it looks like Cannon has asked her to kind of counsel him and have a discussion about everything from family to life in general, relationships, so on and so forth. So let me just get going and and we'll just kind of see what we see um, and let me know what y'all are thinking as we go. A lot of things in common, uh, specifically our love and care for our people. Yes. Uh, Probably go about it in different ways. Uh, (laughs) You have approached it from... uh, you know, academic and a clinical standpoint um, where I feel like, you know, I utilize platforms like this really to create safe spaces for, for men specifically with cancel culture. Um, say we don't, it's no, no longer cancel culture. No. We've got to stop canceling, we got to start counseling. Yeah. Uh, we got to start taking accountability. Um, we have to start. Uh, ha- well, look, you know, yeah, black man swimming, thank you. I was going to ask if you guys could hear it okay. Everything was clean as far as that was concerned. Um, let's see. Oh, all right. So here we go. So I'm going to take a uh, black man swimming uh, as people can hear it. If you can't, if there's any other sound problem, please let me know and uh, I'll let it continue. Having brave spaces and safe places to be vulnerable, to discuss. And as I always say, you know, we're, we're here so, you know, we can feel together, we can reveal together so we can heal together. Yeah. Uh, and you have even addendum to that. You know, <laughs> I say feel, deal, heal. I heard that. So once you feel it, you've got to deal with it. Yeah. And so that you can eliminate it from the deepest root and cause. So you can feel it, you deal with it, and then you can heal. Because if you don't deal, you can't heal. Yeah. I love it. Well, we got a lot to deal with today. <laughs> I'm on your couch, Doc. I'm going to create... Um, some some conversation uh, like i said uh, as as we talked mm-hmm. previous to this i mean uh there's no hold bar we 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 could talk about anything there's nothing off limits uh and i'm i'm in a space of receiving in a space of healing um but there's a lot going on in the world there's a lot going on in my world uh but i just think you know as a man um i got questions uh and there's there's so much going on i think a great place to start you know in our first session today would be the importance of mental health. Oh yeah. Specifically for black men. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's starting to become. Now, let me be clear. I too am an advocate for mental health. I did about five years of therapy after my wife passed. I found it to be extremely useful, not because somebody was telling me what to do or giving me advice, but really all the brother would do every once in a while was just hold up a mirror to my thought process. And, you know, these would be things that I just do every day without thinking about. And that gave me an opportunity to kind of study how I approach situations. So if you can find a good one, um, I highly recommend that you take advantage of therapy. Now, I personally found it useful to have a black male therapist, but we all know that's difficult to find. And as I pointed out on this channel, uh, some of the recent data coming out suggests that over 90 percent of those practitioners in the uh, field of psychology as a whole in regard to therapy and so on and so forth are female. And um, I'm not one to believe that that's not going to impact how, you know, the services services are administered. I do believe whoever is sitting at the table, you know, their experiences, so on and so forth, impact how they deliver those services. And if there is a, a dearth of black men who are who are providing those services, I'm not going to pretend like that's not going to have an impact. Too many men have I run across over the years, long before I got online and started having conversations with even more people have commented about having black women therapists who would turn sessions, especially if you're doing like couples therapy, they would turn sessions into, you know, kind of group beatdowns where they would align with the woman in question and and both attack you. And, And most of the focus was on how well you serviced her needs, right? Whereas yours didn't come about. So I'm not going to pretend like that doesn't happen. I've experienced it directly and I've heard scores of men come forward and tell me the same stories, even within my family, within my friend network, my social network. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, bet whoever it is you're choosing and, and feel free to, to, to change up. 
but not just when things you know get challenging in terms of your worldview. But if you really find that this person you're dealing with is a is functionally a, a misandrist and and does not see your humanity, yeah, change up if you need to. But uh, just wanted to put that on the table. Uh, yeah, Dad said, see, look, he says you were lucky, Doc. I've never had a good one. Yeah, there you go. Um, shout out to Crip Hop Nation. I ain't seen you in a minute, good brother. I hope you're well. He says I just got dragged because I point out in my TA class that this black disabled woman had no experience. I have a major news article on police brutality against disabled people. I got dragged on Twitter. I hear you. I hear you because if she said it, it's supposed to be golden and it's supposed to be followed and not to be questioned. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. Shout out to Brandon for the $10. Appreciate that. He says, Doc, do you think Ayanna is just saying what we black men want to hear or is she a true realist? She al uh, We already know that being a realist is not profitable. And she's, in a, she's a businesswoman at the end of the day. You know, that's an excellent question, man, because I've seen her say things that she didn't have to say. And I've seen her take a lot of flack for it. You know, she went against the Oprah crew, which, you know, cost her money. But at the same time, there's a part of me that can't help but think that there's a degree of pandering going on. So here's what I do. I try to focus on what's what's true and what I hear in the moment. So, you know, I've had flack like on Facebook and Twitter because I'll post things from unpopular people and people take it like, well, you must agree with everything they've said. No. I just thought what they said in this instance was either problematic and needed to be dealt with or was true, whether or not we like the person or not. You know what I mean? So, you know, as you're going to see tonight, when I, as I'm talking through this, if she calls it, you know, straight balls and strikes, if she calls it straight, I give her props for that. If I got a problem with something she said. I'm going to I'm going to say so. But whether or not she's pandering, I take it on a case by case basis. Now, you know, I'll, I'll be honest when I say there's a lot of professional uh, mainstream media, black women who, as far as I'm concerned, not even just black women, black men as well, because Nick, you know, definitely has some, some problems in, in terms of this interview, but, um, you know, a lot of people pander and I think we need to call it out when we need to call it out. That's one of the freedoms of being in this kind of space. But if it's true, it's true. Even if somebody's pandering and they drop a word, you agree with acknowledge what you agree, you agree with and keep it pushing. And if they do it consistently enough and they don't have to, but they still do it especially if it begins to hit them in the pockets, then I might rock with them. But on, at the moment, I just take it on a case by case basis. Uh, shout out to Dante. Appreciate that. He says, yeah, she went on a, a year long smear campaign against Shahrazad Ali after she released her book in 89. Now she's been trying to hold black women accountable in the last 10 years in order to get black men in on her grip. May be the case. That may be the case. I'm not advocating for Ayama Van Zant as a whole. But like I said, call it when you see it. If it's true call it out. If it ain't, call it out. I'm really not advocating that anybody follow anybody blindly. We just deal with what's true and speak out on it. All right. Uh, so here we go. Let's continue. Something of the norm, but it's almost like it's a, it's a trend or it's a phase. It's, it's good to talk about it, yeah. but to actually do it, there's quite a few things that are prohibiting us from doing it in our community. Yeah. Um, there's, first of all, it's just the accessibility. You know, men in therapy, generally, but specifically black men in therapy, one, first thing we're going to say is we don't have the time for that. You know, second thing we're going to say is even if we did have the time for that, how are we going to figure it out? <laughs> and then, like you said, the last thing is we don't have the money for that. Well, and let's be real. I mean, I don't I don't like the dismissal of the reasons as if they're not, it, it can't be true for brothers. If you are especially taking care of others, whether or not you have time is a critical issue. I would I would urge brothers to find the time, but I'm not going to dismiss the fact that, you know, in the position many of us are in, time is a factor and so is money. You don't have it covered in your insurance and you got to pay out of pocket, depending on what you find, it could be challenging. I know uh, a lot of the costs kind of went down as we started to see more and more online counseling, especially during the pandemic. But at the end of the day, those those can be very real things. So I don't like the, the just the arbitrary dismissal of black men's concerns. Um, but at the same time, I would urge you to get it if, if you can. And again, if you can find uh, a good one. Um, and I personally was probably introduced to the idea of therapy was first in the church. Really? Yeah. And that, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't even know. Again, it was probably more called counseling. Right. In, in ministry. Um, That's right. You know, you got couples counseling, yeah. or, you know, better. Then it becomes a matter of finding, uh, you know, somebody who's is willing to be honest against the cost. And it's the same thing in the church as it is in the media in this respect. 
Uh, the church for the black church in particular has always kind of yielded to black women because they're in the majority numbers. For the most part, uh, the church has been known for saving face as far as masculinity. They put black men in elite positions to be the face of it. But most the overwhelming majority of churches I've been to, it was, uh, it was, you know, black men were in the, in the, the lowest number. You know what I mean? Black women overwhelmed uh, as far as the counts were concerned. So you can't tell me that you're not going to have pastors that are very mindful about the impact of what they say. You can, especially in this era, right? This post me too era, you know, we're still in an era of cancel culture, just like they're talking about. You can lose your church as well as your YouTube channel or your job or position um, overnight because people didn't like what you said. And they're going to address that. But I'm simply saying that it, unfortunately the church is not uh, a refuge from that. Churches are, are accountable to those who, you know, make tithes and donations. And those are overwhelmingly women. So, you know, this is why, you know, even back in the 90s, men were going into Islam and they were even just entertaining, not going to church or not addressing any spirituality as believers. Now, if you're an atheist, that's not I'm not what I'm saying doesn't address you. But if you're a believer and, you know, you're, you're still not going anywhere, you're not practicing anywhere or you're switching religions, that says a lot about the gender issue in the church, even though. We didn't talk about it at that time and black men didn't have the language for it. Uh, we were still responding to it and it's still a factor. So, yeah, you can find counseling in the church. Uh, I don't know if they term it that way, but you still have to be mindful of the gender politics and how that may play uh, in regard to the advisement and support that you might be going for. Behavioral counseling for someone <laughs> like myself. <laughs> um, but even in that sense where you get time with an elder at the church, a pastor, just even that time, just to be able to talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I probably got more introduced when I started doing a lot of work in the facilities of incarceration and different prisons, specifically even working with juveniles. I saw I would go in with different psychologists and we would create these group sessions, group therapy and group counseling. And I found I was supposed to be there as somewhat of a mentor, but I found myself uh, doing quite a bit of work and it was it was helpful for me. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, my, my various relationships. <laughs> no <laughs> I, clue what you're talking about. <laughs> I have definitely uh, sat down with many different therapists and counseling in, in that form. But and as of now, you know, I'm probably in counseling four times a week. At least. Really? Yeah. If you, you know, at least twice individually. Sometimes, you know, it all depends. Some in a holistic fashion. I definitely make it a, you know, even in my travel, my work and everything. I have a specific doctor that I do see on, on Tuesdays and Fridays in the morning. Right. And after what's that. your intention? Well, Initially, with that, you know, being someone who also is, you know. And let me say this. I liked her question. What's your intention? That's a good one. And, I, and it's something I urge you think about before you secure a, a therapist of any measure. Right? What is it you're going for and why? You know, good question. Glad she asked it. Let's see how he responds. Damn it. Studying to get my degree in this space. Um, once I left Howard University in 2020, uh, my goal was to, you know, get my master's in, in psychology. So I wanted part of the work was to make sure you, you know, actually spend time in therapy. Right. Um, but, you know, it's been some years now and I, I yearn for it. I desire it. I, I first went in like, oh, yeah, I don't know, I'm just doing this to pick your brain and understand the process. And, yeah. You know, know, I'm good. Uh, and then really spending, those, spending that time. I personally, for me, those, those hours every week, uh, I call it waste management. Mm. It's where I get to just go and let it all out. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, it's useful. I've done that as well. It can be a good way of managing, you know, all the psychic crap uh, that you can accumulate in your own mind. Shout out to Queen Kalila. What's up, girl? Um, my best to your husband as well. Tell him I said, what's up? Um, yeah, you know, it, that can be true. But you can also meditate, you know, and accomplish that same kind of goal without the need for another person. Now, it doesn't mean that another person can't be useful, but, you know, you, you can become overly reliant, I think, at times of doing that kind of thing that Nick is talking about. And you can do the same thing with meditation, especially when you get adept, when you become adept at it. You know, you can really clear your own psychic garbage just by learning how to meditate. I mean, not even necessarily make sense of everything, because yeah. uh, that's never, you know, everything you, don't have to make sense. Yeah, but if just to to verbalize to have the opportunity to to ponder and sit and sometimes cry sometimes just breathe you know uh but there's a lot that you know only have i always call it my spiritual bandwidth 
I can only take so much before I have to get it all out. And and A, it keeps you from being alone in your head without adult supervision. <laughs> right. Because that could be a dangerous place right, to be. Right. I mean, just for you, for all of us. And to be able to get... I don't like that adult supervision crap, but, you know, anyway, look. If you're an adult, you can mind your own mind. If you have somebody else, great. You don't have to, though. An objective third party. Mm. One of the thing, two things I want to say, I, I, and of course, as a woman of color, a woman of African descent, of course, my community, black people, but I'm also brown and red, mm. uh, right in my face. I don't have to do DNA 23 and me. My what? grandmother was born on the reservation. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> and so I have to say black, brown, and red. I think black men are now standing up a little more when it comes to mental health and personal care than uh, the brown men, Latin men, or mm. the red men who are just really silent. Right. Um, but I, I do encourage, support, applaud you because of nothing else, having another person to talk to, to dump, to dump your brain out with, keeps you accountable to yourself right. and to others. Because a man who is not accountable to himself is a danger to him, is, is not accountable to anyone. Right. He's a danger to himself and everybody else. Right. And when you're alone in your head without adult supervision, making up stuff, and you don't have anybody to bounce that off of, right. where's your accountability? Right. That can be true, but you can also find yourself in a hostile environment where there's no support. And the only support, or at least those who are attempting to frame it as support around you, are those who may be trying to take advantage of you, manipulate you, use you. There are times when keeping your own counsel is actually healthier than the alternative. And I think people underestimate how hostile the environment can be that many of us uh, find ourselves in. This is why I go back to posting dead sets statement a moment ago and appreciate that super chat, man. He says, rarely spoken about is compulsory court ordered therapy where the therapist tries to convince the patient that they have done wrong. Family court does this often. See, essentially what he's talking about is a hostile environment where, you know, even those who are supposed to be there on your behalf are there to manipulate and hurt. So, you know, there are times when keeping your own counsel, when, um, you know, looking to your own resources, meditating and identifying with people who you know you can trust is the better alternative. You just have to put yourself in a situation where you can find somebody that is there for you. So, you know, and somebody you can trust to give you good counsel or at the very least know when to hold the mirror up to help you observe how you think. But they don't have an agenda in mind in terms of trying to manipulate you or hurt you or whatever their you know purposes may be. So, um, there, you know, that, I think people underestimate how hostile men in general and especially black men can find themselves in in terms of their environment. Right. You could when you up there, you really think you got it going on, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Facts. True. True. That I mean, you touch on so many different things because in something that you said earlier, I was just like, we gotta get these cameras rolling because you're here dropping the gems. But you were just talking about specifically, you know, black men because I was talking about you know what we what not what we deal with but from the aspect of being the heads of our household being the ones that have to usually take the weight on their shoulders or uh, not or and then when that's taken away from you yeah so when when brothers are losing jobs when brothers have feel have been emasculated when when brothers um you know are getting older and not being able to you know handle or compete in society uh like they once were when they were in their prime, at some point, you know, and we'll, we'll dive into this in, in a later session, it's like, you're like, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Yeah. And therefore that starts to mess with you. And if you don't be, you can't talk to somebody about that. You know, we always talk, we're so goal oriented. We're so driven. We're so, you know, we gotta manifest this. But when the manifestation isn't coming in the timing that you want it, when the goal isn't, you're not hitting the mark exactly how you want it. How do you deal with that? Mm. You know, what? It, who do you talk to? when you missed all the shots? Who do you talk to when you lost your job? Who do you talk to, who do you confide in when the woman that you love no longer loves you and leaves you for someone else? Mm. Those are the things where we body or embody or in, in bottle all of that stuff yeah. uh, up until sometimes it's, it's too late. Now, I've been, I haven't talked about it in a while, but I have been an advocate for, you know, people finding their own way to release tension, stress. We know for black men, most particularly stress is a killer. And we have plenty of it. So we have to find ways to release. Uh, I know it's been a couple of years, but I used to do some of my shows where I just show you clips of me at the beach because that for me is very relaxing. I just go to watch the sunset. That's it. 
So it ain't like I'm I'm posting pictures of me running in and out the water. You know, it's, that's not what it is. But for me, watching the sunset at the beach brings me peace. I can I'll meditate out there. I'll chill. And, you know, unfortunately, from Fresno, it's like a two and a half hour drive each way. So if you see me at the beach, you know, I really had to release. But I'm an advocate for people finding whatever that release is. As I mentioned earlier, when I was acknowledging uh, Jaguar Archery's presence, um, you know, I was saying I, I haven't been to the, the shooting range. Um, I go to the gun range, but I also go to the archery range and I'll go out there and shoot. And I haven't done that in a while. That's that brings me peace. You know what I mean? Those are things that I want every brother to, to know. I want you to know what that is for you, you know, and, and can you go to that when you need to? Because it is important. And Nick is right about that. And we don't know, you know, it, we don't we had nowhere to turn. I think one of the greatest crimes, one of there are many, but one of the greatest crimes perpetuated against black men specifically is the level to which their humanity and their hearts have been devalued, diminished, and dehumanized, and that they have become doing machines. The greatest value a black man has, if, in many instances, is what he can do for somebody, right. and how he can do it, and how much he can do it, and how much he earns doing it. I mean, I, I hear it and see it among young people in the relationships, you know, oh, you gonna get my nails done, and you gonna uh -huh. do this, and you gonna do that. Right. You know, they've been demeaned and devalued and, and, and dehearted Right. to the point where they value themselves right. based on what they can do. Mm. Well, it's not just that we value ourselves. We've been taught in this social order that that's the only value we have. That's the primary value we have, right? So we're used for that and at the same time dismissed if she monkey branches and finds someone else that can quote unquote do it better. So, you know, this, this really, this use of black men as doing machines is real. And it's also tied to, you know, what we talk about when we talk about John Henry, when we when we're John Henry, you know, when we're just working to the point where uh, that same type of work put grandfathers and great grandfathers in the grave. You know, many of those men worked until their bodies were broken and kept working until they died. You know what I mean? And that's how they supported family. Many of us are still doing that. There's no fanfare for it. There's no acknowledgement. There's often not even any thanks. But many of us are still doing that kind of labor for others. Uh, I call it male uh, relationship, emotional labor. We do that kind of work. It's not just physical labor. It's also emotional labor. And sometimes doing the physical labor is also emotional labor for other people's well-being. Uh, that kind of nonstop approach is it can send us to a much earlier grave than we need to be. It's one of the reasons that black men, even though our life expectancy has gone up over the last few years, it's still lower than everybody else's for the most part, particularly in terms of white men and women, black men and women. We still have the lowest. And a lot of that has to do with this John Henry notion that we still have because our social value is still tied up in what we can provide to others. And there are plenty of people that have learned to predate on that, to become predators of it, right? And, and consume it at all costs. Um, and they'll tell you whatever they can to get you to provide for them. So we've, we've created spaces where we put each other up on game because when everybody in your life you find is taking from you and not reciprocating anything. That can be a heavy revelation. It's not as obvious as people would think if that's all you've grown up in was the space of when you were young, uh, you've had people prepare you to be used and you've been taught that it was a valuable thing that others use you. And then you get to a point where you have something to offer, usually in your late thirties, forties and fifties. And all of a sudden, of course, you have people that are quickly there to usurp whatever it is you have to provide. Very few people actually know how to reciprocate. Very few. This is why that whole conversation a number of years ago about, you know, what people bring to the table, this infuriated a lot of women. But one of the things we noticed is very few women knew how to answer that question other than out of arrogance. I bring myself. Well, OK, but what do you actually bring? And here's the thing. Many of us still to this day don't know what to ask for or expect from others who want to even reciprocate. I've run into people who've even wanted to over the years, and I didn't often know how to ask, what to ask for. I didn't even know what was what should be available for what I'm bringing. I had plenty to bring. They had plenty they wanted. But not only could they not articulate what they could reciprocate, I often didn't know what to ask for because I was so used to not asking for anything. And then I would meet brothers who would go find women from other cultures who were raised in environments where serving men was a regular feature in the culture. And they would come back and talk about the different experiences they had 
And this is what I think was one of the main uh, game changers for black men was discovering that there's a long list of resources available if you're in, you know, in an environment where people understand what men are often reciprocated with. You know what I mean? So those are the kind of conversations that men have been having over the last few years. And it's been infuriating Western women because they're not equipped. They haven't been trained to provide those types of resources. They see it as slavery. But women from other environments and other cultural backgrounds look at it as reciprocal. As a matter of fact, they tend to find that, uh, you know, Western men are willing to give more than they're used to getting for resources that are common for them, that our women identify as slavery or women, Western women in particular, like runs the racial gamut, as a matter of fact. So these are all important issues that we do need to talk about. Fix it, get it, make it happen. And no place have I seen in our world does anybody tell black men how to be? Mm. How to be with themselves, how to be true to themselves, how to be with their feelings, mm. how to be with their heart, mm. you know, um, and, 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 and it's criminal. So what I don't want to underestimate the importance of that. Now, her reasons for saying that could be anything. It could be pandering. It could be a hustle. But it doesn't change the fact that I think she's right in that instance. Um, this whole question of how it is we can be. Now, what some of us have taken to is becoming the villain. Right. We've accepted that we are the villain. We are the villain that black women have told the world we're, we are, that white society has told the world we are. Clearly, that programming is in place. Y'all saw me play the clip earlier. You saw that those two young men sitting in that car were, were they were perceived to be the villain simply because they were there. We get that treatment all over the place from within the community and from outside the community. Right. So many of us have embraced being the villain because we get it from so, so many places and we've tried to take control of that narrative. We're dusty. We're all these kind of terms. But there's another alternative. You can embrace that. That's one way of doing it. You can embrace it or you can walk away from all of it, which some brothers have done as well. Right. Passport OG is one that could talk to you about that. You know, left the country, reframed how to identify himself. And he had a great show this morning where he was talking about, you know, he and his father, you know, who are both geeks and his father, you know, kind of taught him math. And, you know, they lived outside the country and, and they were able to explore a type of black masculinity that that's often dismissed here, but was appreciated elsewhere. And I think in that regard, if you choose to, if you're really looking to figure out how to be, as she points out, you can be the villain and you can embrace that, you know, but there's one downside to that, right? Even though you're no longer playing the socially prescribed script, right? There's a freedom in being the villain. You're still kind of trapped because the villain is confined to being the opposite of what people ask for. So you're still confined. They just don't control you directly. But because you're playing a particular script, you're playing a script of your choosing. You're still only playing the opposite of what society says they want from you. You can abscond and back out of both and go figure out who the fuck you are. If you're the dude that likes to sit on the beach, if you're the dude that goes to the archery range, if you're the dude that likes to put, take the top down and smoke a cigar as you drive, if you're the dude that likes to t travel in and out the country and do whatever the hell you like to do with no regard to what other people think about it. If you actually can take the time, and this is key, if you can take the time to figure out what you like, and this is what I mean. I don't care if it's being a professor or a master martial artist. You learn the curriculum in the early stages. But when you reach the black belt or PhD stage, right, there's a point where your teachers are starting to look for your own individuality. And that's going to come out in however it's comfortable comfortable for you to express. Now, for me, when I got my doctorate, it took another six, seven years before I started to really figure out who I was as a scholar. And this is nothing anybody could prescribe to me. Nobody could tell me how to do it or what to do. This is when my own individuality began to come out. And whether people liked it or not, I didn't give a damn. I invested in who I was and I took that leap. And that's what I'm talking about. That's actually what we have to do just in terms of who we choose to be. That's what they're talking about now, what it means to be. Have you taken the time to individualize? Have you taken the time to actually step back and decide who you want to be outside of people's expectations, be they positive or negative? Fuck them both. Who do you want to be? Who do you choose to be regardless of others' expectations of you? Right? That's one of the sacrifices that many of us still have to make. Not being beholden to others' expectations and choosing 
to find out what it means to be ourselves. That's a crucial task. And some people, it takes lifetimes to figure out. There you go. What happens is then they begin to do the things that are expected of them. And that's how they're evaluated. Mm. And then if they can't do that anymore, whether it's the job or pay the mortgage or whatever, then they're just cast off like socks in the corner. Right. <laughs> like, right. And it happens to black women also, mm -hmm. but usually because of the children in our care, we're given a little more leeway, but the way it's done for black men. And as I shared with you, one of the things my teacher taught me was one of the greatest kryptonites for, for man, a man in general, black men specifically, is the feeling, the belief, the treatment that he is somehow inadequate. Mm. Mm. And when you devalue a man, he's going to feel inadequate. When you dehumanize him, when you dehart him, so then where does he go with that? Right. He's inadequate and he, he doesn't serve a purpose because he can't do what you need him to do to make you feel better about yourself. What's the purpose? What's the point? What's the point? And that's why we have these incredible rises in suicide. Yeah. I personally think it's why we have this and I don't know the figures, I don't know what they are now, but the increase between, I think it was 2017 and 2021, a 30-something percent increase in the number of black men with prostate cancer, mm. starting early in Hawaii because their manhood is under attack. I've been talking about this for years. Dr. Curry's been talking about this. A lot of the Brothers in Black Male Studies has been talking about this, the rate of, of prostate cancer. And actually, Tommy was the first one to hit me to it. Because I remember at the time my son was, uh, you know, in school and they had the whole school in elementary school do this run for breast cancer. And so, they came, you know, he came home with the little uh, pink ribbon. And I said, what is that? And he told me what it was. And, uh, and I just remember thinking, OK, that's interesting. So they got the whole school and then I'm seeing it on NBA players and whatnot. And I'm saying, OK, so we got all these institutions that are invested. And um, I was in a conversation with Tommy. I think that's what it, I think I, I mentioned it to him and he was like, man, look up the stats in regard to cancer. And I never bothered to. I just never did. But I looked it up in that instance and I was blown away because what I found was that uh, there were far more brothers suffering uh, from cancer than there were uh, women. And nobody talked about it. Right? Black women had the highest rates of cancer among women. Black men had the highest rates of cancer among men, but was considerably higher than men and women black men alone. So in that regard, she's absolutely right. And a lot of them, you know, a lot of the doctors can't, you know, say what exactly has caused that. But at the end of the day, it's happening. And I drastically underestimated how much it was happening. I assumed subconsciously that if society is pointing out breast cancer is a problem, then those numbers must be daunting. And whatever men are dealing with can't be relevant. I just never thought to ask the question. When you actually delve into the research, you find that, uh, yeah, black men are extremely vulnerable to it, even though people don't talk about it. Uh, there really needs to be some real support around prostate cancer. Right. Right. And, you know, uh, their their psyche is not nourishing and nurturing them and their, their masculinity, because we're in the world. Where right. in the world do we where do we see them lifted, right. honored? Uh, I don't want to say respected. And here's what I hear in the back of my mind. So let me just go ahead and deal with it. Mm -hmm. Black women mm. saying, well, look what they do and look how they are and look what they do, you know, and we unwittingly participate in the emasculation, the dehumanization, the devaluation and the disheartening of black men because they didn't do it the way we wanted them to. Well, you know, I do think um, that there is unwitting and there is wittingly at the same time. But shout out to Medium Man. He did a show not too long ago, where he pointed out um, that, you know, his argument was that, of course, black women act this way and perceive us this way because they believe it. They believe the stereotyping. They believe the, the you know, the, the, the kind of misframing uh, of black men. They believe it. And if you believe it, then it becomes logical that you would assume all of these negative things about black men. We started talking about the programming. And I agree with him in that regard. But here's the problem for many black men. You can understand how this programming has taken place and, and, and how it's claimed so many uh, generations of black women's perspectives about black men. But at the same time, you're laying next to this person. You're in family with this person. You're in, you're, you're in contract with this person. You are tied to this person in one way, shape or form, and they are actively trying to hurt you. So brainwashed or not, you still have to deal with the reality of your environment, the reality of your situation, and you can't ignore it for the sake of being chivalrous um, 
you know, it, it, because it can cost you a lot, your life. So you still have to address that this person may be brainwashed, but they are still out to hurt you. And you and they've already hurt you in critical ways. So it's not a fantasy. It's not something you're, you're you're imagining. It is it is and can be actually happening. And the thing about it is it's not just women operating by themselves. It's operating with institutions at their behest. Right. The average person getting a divorce, especially if you have kids, when you start talking about family court, you're not it's, it's not a guess about whether or not there's an institution operating on her behalf. It, it's a reality. And if you don't believe me, go sit in family court and just watch. You can actually do that. Just go sit in a family court and just watch how men and women are treated. It's a reality. Oh. So. Do it. Mm -hmm. Mothers, wives, girlfriends, sisters. That's that's such a complex conversation. And we didn't even get into you know my own personal life. Um being that, you know, I love the matriarchs of my family. Uh my grandmother, my great grandmother is currently 104. Wow. Living in Kannapolis, North Carolina. As oh my speak. God, Kannapolis. I know Kannapolis. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's where the, the name Cannon comes from. Everybody yeah. in that town, last name is Cannon. Really? Uh, textile, you know, going all the way back to the cotton fields. Wow. Uh, and it's such a strong and vibrant black woman. Now, you know, I see some of you, you're already seeing this. A lot of you have. I know BGS covered it the other day. Um, but this is the interesting part. When you start talking about pandering, this is how you can tell uh, Nick was raised in a gynocracy and more particular than that, he's raised in what I call a gynopotestal family structure. And this is basically where within the black family or many black families, you'll find that there's, there's, you know, various levels of mother figures, there's grandmother, there's mother, there's usually one woman who kind of holds the leadership stick as it were, but there are satellites of families and households in connection to her. Right? So, if you're if you came up under a single mother, she's tied to her mother, her sister, her auntie, her mother, her grandmother. All of these women are in connection, even though they don't live under the same physical household. Right. And if you come in and try and get with one of these women, you find that you may get along with this woman, this woman, this individual woman just fine. But now you have to address her family structure and her behavior might even change in regard to what's expected of her in regard to how she relates to you. In other words, those women will often expect her to be the leader of her household. So you're coming in, you know, especially if you're the kind of brother I, I, I'm imagining some of you are, and I know I am, you're a leader, right? And you come into this relationship and things are working fine to a degree, but what she, what's expected of her and what she begins to act out in terms of her family structure is at odds with what you bring to the table and how you roll. This is how I look at uh, Erica Badu's family structure, right? You know, I think it's one of the contributing factors why so many of those brothers come and go. Because you're not just marrying her, you're marrying into this kind of protestal family where you have different levels of women in authority in a family family structure that you, if you're an ideal candidate by their definition, you have to sub, you have to be subservient to, you have to fall in line with, and then you become another resource. What does that mean? It means that any one of them can call upon you to provide resources that normally their man would provide to them, at least in theory, right? But you become a resource to the group so the group can continue to function regardless of what your needs are. And when you've been squeezed like an orange and you no longer have resources that they, they deem valuable, you find yourself going through a divorce, you find yourself being pushed out, and that's if you were ever legally married. You might just be brought in, used, and pushed out and replaced with another. Right? This is the continuous cycle. This is how the gynecological family sees men. Men are a resource. And the other men that are a resource, usually those families don't have like grandfathers, fathers who are married and still there. Gynecological family usually doesn't have that. It's not impossible, but it's usually not the case. Grandma might have a longstanding boyfriend or a couple of them. Mama too, right? Sisters, you know, the woman you're dealing with might have a few. You might be one of them, whether you know it or not, right? They have those kind of relationships. But the other kind of men they have, are their sons. And those sons become what we call simp enforcers, soldiers on behalf of the gynocracy. They become used. They're, they're disposable as well. They might be called in to handle protection issues, physical protection issues. They may be called in to be um, pit bull enforcers, right? Sent out to attack people, right? Attack dogs, if you were, that might be called into play. They might be used to repair things, fix things, provide money here, provide labor there. The men are disposable, exchangeable resources. 
matter what they are, whether they're the sons, whether they're boyfriends, whether they're husbands, which are usually temporary, but men are, you know, kind of the wheels on the car. They, they come and go, they're replaced at random. The core focus is the gynocracy. And Nick strikes me as the, the kind of man who comes out of that framework, right? So when he's praising all of these various levels of women in his family, you know, he's, he's kissing the ring, he's demonstrating, you know, he's prostrating himself to show uh, the women, the very women he wants to support this channel and these particular shows that he bows to them. You know, he, he is, he's, he's in the gynocratic order. Um, you know, this is the same thing that you'll hear pastors do uh, in their sermons on Sunday. They, they want to keep those checks flowing. So they're not going to rock the boat, but more to that, they've actually been raised in these structures. So he knows praising black women is something that is going to get him the attention he needs and wants and secure him that kind of view. Um, the irony to this is that even though he's doing a lot of this, it's principally, you know, Ayala that pushes back occasionally against his programming. But this is how the programming works. Probably the, probably the strongest person, like my superhero, um, Kareem Cannon, um, who then gave, you know, birth to my grandfather, who married my grandmother, as such a powerful woman, who then gave birth to my father, who then, you know, teenagers, um, my mother and my father met each other and had me. Uh, and in that... And mama, that's, I heard the, that. that's the... Hit the wrong button. Crap. I have to find it again. But what I was about to say, though, is notice that there's there's not a lot of celebration about strong men. Not a lot of celebrating. And, and we assume that means that there were no strong men. But in actuality, what it means is that praising strong men goes against the culture of the gynocracy. You're not supposed to do that. If you do compliment men, you have to find a way to give a, a backward compliment, not a backward one, but kind of a subtle compliment to women simultaneously. That's the only way you can praise men. You can only praise men when you're subtly saying that it's a woman that's responsible for him being complimented for whatever he's being complimented for. Otherwise, your praise needs to be strictly for women. And I know that sounds whatever, but this is how this works. This is how this works. Now, I, I, I moved the place around. I apologize. Let me see if I can find it. Feeling the belief, the treatment that he is somehow inadequate. Mm. And, and when you see the number of black men with prostate cancer, mm. starting early, yeah. for instance. That's, that's such a complex conversation. And we didn't even get into my grandfather, who married my grandmother, that's such a powerful woman, who then gave birth to my father, who then, you know, teenagers, um, my mother and my father met each other and had me. Uh, and How do you say all of that and mention nothing about not only the men of your family, but not even your father? Interesting. And in that, those are my examples of relationships. Yeah. You know, I watch, like I said, my great grandmother be a matriarch. I watch my grandmother be a matriarch who helped raise me and the teenagers who had me. Um, and then my mother being, you know, a young mother, so resilient, brilliantly trying to figure it out from putting herself through night school. Look, when's the last time you guys have seen a production where a person was praising the men in their family? When's the last time you've seen that? You know, I was listening to or uh, reading, I posted it on my Facebook page. There, there was a uh, an interview with Ice Cube. And they were asking him why there weren't going to be any more Friday movies. And he said something I thought was very interesting. Something I hadn't, I hadn't I had not heard him say before. He said, because the he said, first and foremost, the Friday movies are family movies. Right. And I was like, yeah, yeah. OK, technically, you're right. I had to go back in. My, uh, yeah, they're family movies. This was the important part. He said, but the key to it is the stories are about black men working it out. He said they're family movies where black men work it out. He said, this is why Hollywood doesn't want to see more of those. I had never really, you know, contemplated those films that way. But when I go back to the classic first Friday movie, what was it fundamentally about at the end? Right. Craig fighting off a bully, standing up, right. Standing up to his own fear, right. In Debo and being willing to fight him. This, this element of it is key. But how much of that do we do in popular mainstream culture? How many, how much of that do we actually hear where we even, let alone anybody else, you know, praise the men in their family? They, so they often don't. And I'll often find, especially when I'm talking to a student, like I have a young woman who will talk about the women in her family, because when I have students do that, they almost always defer to the women. And when I specifically ask about men, 
there's usually somebody there. And a lot of the time, my young women will respond with, oh, you know, like, oh, yeah, there was such and such. He's there and he, he's done this, this and that. But it doesn't it doesn't register for them to consider him unless you specifically ask about men. But very few people will start off the conversation praising the men in their family. And we talk about brothers who may have been there for, for generations, holding it down, being consistent. They don't even get acknowledged. Sometimes it'll be by women who are raised by fathers, single fathers, who they have nothing but respect for. And those men have sacrificed. And when you ask her about who she honors, she'll start talking about aunties and shit <laughs> and completely by, you know, step, step over her own father at times. I've had this happen. It's the programming, right? We are the floor that people walk on in the community. This is not something, you know, we're supposed to sacrifice. We're supposed to fall on our sword at every turn. You're not supposed to ask for recognition. But when you ask people who they recognize and who they remember, they defer to the women. Because for the most part, we tend to function as a gynocracy. That's heavily subsidized by the state. The state is what provides women this resource where they can be in a position of authority. Whether she's poor and has that greater access to welfare, whether she's middle class, has greater access to education and white collar jobs. At the end of the day, black men may technically earn more, but black women tend to be employed more consistently. So she may not be getting paid as much as white women, but she's consistently employed, or, or at least that's how it has been pre pandemic. And that has a huge impact on a relatively poor community. It is what it is. We may not like hearing that we're relatively poor, but when you compare our day to day income with others, it is what it is. Right. That being said, consistent employment becomes a huge factor when you have rampant unemployment for whole other demographics in the same community. So this is what has provided for a, gyn a gynocracy. This is not a naturally occurring thing. This is something since slavery that has been allotted to black women. And in that regard, has given them position over family, position over how the family functions and the decisions it makes. This is what we mean when we talk about gynocracy. It's basically a female patriarchy subsidized by the state. But what happens when the state begins to withdraw that, that, that those resources, institutional and otherwise? That becomes a critical question. To several jobs at a time, being a teenager with a young, young baby, and then, you know, her various personal relationships, because my parents never really were in a relationship. Um, my father went back to North Carolina to, you know, get his education, stay out of trouble, started his new family, uh, while I kind of bounced around amongst the three. Uh, so even in that, when time for me to get into my relationships and my love life, I saw various things. So I was willing and ready to open to, I'm open for whoever loves me. Okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, and I never really understood. Now that's key. Many of us find ourselves in a position, especially when you're a young man, and you're just leaving home, as it were, at least you're that age, right? 18 and above, when you start looking for what kind of life you want to create for yourself, what kind of family you want to create for yourself. Many of us find ourselves vulnerable to, what did he say? Whomever loves me, especially if you're not used to experiencing love, right? Affection beyond just food, clothing, and shelter, which I don't mean to minimize, but if that's the only love you know, not, it's not hard to really make the argument that you haven't experienced love. So what happens when you run across people that are far more demonstrative in their love? A lot of black boys, a lot of young black men are not prepared for that, especially if it's being done in bad faith and somebody's doing it to manipulate. Black men can find themselves subject to manipulation along the lines of experiencing affection and love in a fashion that we are not accustomed to receiving it. If you've been trained to be a disposable resource, you are often not prepared to be treated well. And believe it or not, whether people like it or not, this is the reality of, of, of what many black men are finding out in the dating and mating market. They're finding when they expand their resources and begin to look for people that have a different cultural framework, a different a, a worldview, especially as it pertains to affection, uh, reciprocating what's sacrificed and given to them. If you've not been, if you've not experienced that, you've not dealt with people who are trained to extend that, it can be a powerful and overwhelming thing that changes the game. Sometimes to your detriment, if you're being manipulated, but sometimes to your benefit. And I'll tell you this, when brothers find that kind of support, 
trying to get them to come back to you know some dysfunctional stuff does not work stood or should it uh the importance that i do now because i'm somebody who's had many relationships but there is a strength in the black relationship yes um but now because i have been through various relationships i get i get a lot of flack and ridicule for being a successful black man who's currently not uh in a monogamous relationship with a black woman and what that example is for not only my own children but even you know people who look up to me or they're, they're trying to lead by example because you know even as a lot i get quite often i see it in the comments of like you can't be uh pro-black in the streets and white in the sheets or, or other things that, that they say in the in the settings of like you know how can you be so for the culture you know as a black man but we don't see you you know marrying a black woman currently you know uh and i you know i come up with my various excuses you know where i say you know I was married to Mariah Carey. That is a black woman. Or even, you know, one of my baby mamas is dark skin or all of these things that I say. Why? Then, Why do you feel you need to respond? That's my question. I mean, in, in, in trying to dig deep into my psychosis, of, <laughs> uh, you know, she am dropped. I, you know, is there, as someone who's, you know, attempting to, to lead by example, someone who's attempting to, you know, even as you, as you put it, I understand the power and the importance of a black woman. Um, and even the definition of, of what that is, but as you know, as someone who is prominent in in a, a figure in the culture that people do. If you value, were poor, would it be okay? <laughs> or would they care? They wouldn't care. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not. If I consider myself a king, they want to see who the queen is. Yeah. If I'm the pastor. They're looking at the first lady. You I know. So why? Why? Did you volunteer for that, or did oh. were you were, were you voted into that place? Oh. Yeah, no. I, I mean, but again, we we have responsibility. And I want to get into this, you know, in a later session too. But as public figures, specifically public figures with responsibilities, you know what I mean. If I was just your typical rapper or comedian or entertainer, that I've you know I even use terms like I ain't no role model. I'm a real model, you know. I get like, but. I do value, you know, my voice and do want it to be a voice for change and inspiration. So, you know, I got to check myself in every every component. And, you know, I think it's about equanimity. You know, it's about the things where if I'm, if I'm pouring into the community, into the culture. Sometimes Nick doesn't know that there is a time to be quiet and listen, but she about to hit him. In one aspect, I'm not perfect, but I also do understand like some of these things are up for conversation. I'm willing to be accountable. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to grow. So I, I, I even, you know, put all of that out there to say, even in a session and in, in dealing with my mental health, those are things that go through my mind. Everything from the ideas of, you know, what is the definition of uh, a strong relationship? What is the definition of, you know, being a good father? What is the definition of, you know, being someone who's prominent in the culture and, and being, you know, so-called responsible? Mm. Uh, those are the things that go through my mind at night. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Start laughing. At I, I I mean, there you got so much in there. I don't I don't even know. I don't even. <laughs> That's know. why we here, Doc. <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say, I, you know, you. I think you told me you're a, a Xer or Zer or. Yeah, I'm a I'm, I'm a Gen. You X. were born I'm in before 80. the millennials. Okay. I was born in the eighties. Okay. <laughs> and you're also living in the Aquarian age, mm. which is about oneness. Yes. Okay. Now, first, him being Gen X is key because this is you know we definitely got that training. We were the first generation to really deal with the single parenthood dynamic to the degree that we have. Um, so that, 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 you know, gynocratic training is real for Gen X. And of course, when you look at the culture from the music and onward, the adoration of women and, you know, the idea of romance and one's happiness found in a woman, that was, that was very common for Gen X. So that's an important feature in this, but you know, what she's trying to hit him with is, is just kind of this sense that, you don't need to be beholden to this idea. Um, he's talking about the, the, you know, what it looks like to have black love and the impact, the social impact of that symbolism, the, the visual and all of that. And I've called that a couple of years ago. I called it the black velvet painting. And what I was suggesting a couple of years ago is that it might be necessary to put the velvet painting down and just deal with the woman standing in front of you. And, you know, if you don't choose to be with her, don't be with her. If you choose to, then choose to. But don't do it simply for the sake of sacrificing for others so they can see this particular idea, because that in itself doesn't serve you and it doesn't serve her and it doesn't serve your family just to do it for that purpose. Do it because that there, there's a deeper connection that you identify. Right. 
And that's kind of where she's starting to go with him in that regard, right? She's starting to push him in that sense, but also understand saying something as Gen X. Now she's a boomer and she actually talks about in different places, how she grew up. And she said it earlier, she grew up in this era of the Panthers. There was this, you know, very strong idea of what the black community was as a Gen Xer and being the son of a Panther. I grew up in that, that era as well, but I grew up in it as a child. And I want to say that the Gen X is probably the last generation that had that idea of race loyalty that we do. What I'm noticing from millennials and younger is it's not in place like that. It's not in place like that. I watched my son grow up in this era, him and his friends. I listened to the conversations they had. They don't have that same kind of thing. You can instill it in your child, but it's not as much of a mass macro kind of framework as it once was. So you're not getting people that just are, are going to be black identified in their dating and mating simply because they're black. And when you deal with the fact that, you know, well, I won't say the fact, but when you deal with the notion that you can find yourself treated with greater respect and humanity by those that haven't been socialized to see you as nothing but a footstool or something to be used, that changes the game permanently. And a lot of young men are having those experiences and they have been having, having them since elementary school. I'm telling you, it's a different reality, but I'm gonna let her cook and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in uh, on this a little more. And a lot, you know, they sued him and took his money and everything, but Robin, a thick sang blurred line. Mm. The lines are becoming more and more blurred. They are. In terms of what these systems and structures and lines and, and boxes that we were in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went from LBGT to LBGTQ. To L I, I mean, you know, the Plus. lines are becoming more and more blurred. Right. And in terms of interracial, intercultural um, partnerships, relationships, marriages, it's a sign of the times. Mm. It's what is going on now. I mean, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but mm. I'm just, I've just i got bras that I bought in 1980, the same year you were born. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that wasn't two women together in, in, in my time? Right. Okay, stone them. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Men in heels, right. stone them. Right. Okay, so part of it for you to consider Part of it for you to consider is that a lot of those lines are blurred and you as a black man dating a, a woman of another race or culture are demonstrating that you can love who you love and still take care of your people. Mm. Why isn't that a consideration right. that you can? Now, this is something that we often find many black women have more issue with than black men, right? Because the whole question we've heard over the last number of years is that uh, it doesn't matter. You could be a billionaire donating, you know, millions to black college campuses. It still doesn't matter if you got a white woman on your arm or a Hispanic wife or whatever, uh, you know. So she's actually trying to get him to really think about that alongside a different set of terms. Why can't it be that you can be with whomever you choose to be with? And the strange thing about it that nobody really thinks about that can include black women. American black women, if you find what you find and you like what you, it doesn't, it's not about necessarily excluding that. My question on the table is, can you put the velvet painting aside and deal with a woman on the terms that actually speak to your humanity, speak to what you need? And it can be anybody. It can be a woman from another country. It can be, a, you know, somebody you grew up with. It doesn't it matter. It's a different question. It's not necessarily about I'm going to avoid all black women or I'm going to avoid all Asian women or I'm going to. That's not what it's about. It's about if I step outside of this social expectation that I be with somebody based on what other people are telling me I'm supposed to be with simply on the basis of being black. If I step outside of that. If I find somebody that I'm happy with. That's the only thing that matters. That's it. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. And that's what she's trying to get him to see. She's that's what I'm saying. If, you know, she may be doing this to pander. Truthfully, I don't give a fuck. She's right. I'm not talking about, you know, endorse her and support her and everything she says or does. No, I'm saying in this instance, she's right. And that's where I treat it. That's where I leave it. Somebody's right, they're right. Leave it at that. She's right. And if black men can actually learn to undo our programming and choose who we want to be with based on what actually, you know, brings us contentment, what actually, what the, who we actually relate to. Because I'm not going to salt you. If you find, you know, an African woman, if you find a Caribbean woman, if you find a South American woman, if you find an Asian woman, I'm not, if you, a European woman, I don't give a damn. My question to you is always going to be, are you cool? Are you content? 
Does this bring you peace? Does your relationship do for you what you need it to do for you? Because here's the thing. I personally find uh, dysfunction uh, to be distasteful. I don't like it. I find women where argument is their love language. Personally, I can't stand that shit. But there are brothers that actually like that. If that's how you want to live, hey, as long as you're happy. But my question is, what happens if you're not happy with the women in your environment and you go elsewhere and people want to publicly shame you for it? What I stand for is black men having the freedom to choose the lives that make them happy, that bring them contentment, that bring them peace, that bring them truthfully whatever it is they're looking for. Because I got to accept that some brothers like chaos. Personally, I hope that, that doesn't stay the case. But you know what? Again, if that's your thing, that's your thing. But she's trying to get him to understand that you can step outside of those kind of social expectations and deal with what brings you happiness and and the reason that this is so instrumental is because this is not how black men are socialized. We're not socialized to look for what brings us peace. We're brought up to, and I remember this, we're socialized from a very young age to provide something for black women. We're never really taught what to look for. We're not taught what to avoid. We're not taught that we have value to the point where we can say no and we can choose other than, especially with Gen X, we were taught your existence is to provide something for another black woman. No, change the script. You choose who you want to be with based on what brings you your definition of happiness. Fuck the rest. Be who you are personally and you do the strength. Maybe that's not your sole contract mm. to marry a black woman, but to take care of the black community. And to do it in a way where you are, are out in the world and, and people see you and you handle yourself and you speak your truth and you, you state your intention and you love Becky. <laughs> <laughs> what people also got to understand is, you know, when we think of interracial relationship, the first thing we jump to, especially with black men, is Becky. But we're in an environment, we're in a time period where the world is available to, to brothers. So, you know. It's not limited to white women. It's not limited. You know, it's 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 global. And if you're willing to learn the culture of a new environment and go meet people in that environment and engage people on those terms, acting in good faith. You got the world as your oyster. So, you know, this kind of, you know, even though I know she was just joking, I just want to kind of put that out there because we, you know, in the black community, we just get real fixated on white and black. And that is hardly the case, even for those here in the United States, I've been talking for years about what I call, you know, the poor man's passport, because only a select percentage of men or a select percentage of black folk, period, get passports and travel abroad. It's a very small percentage of us that actually do. Even smaller when you're just talking about men. Right. But there's a poor man's passport. I live in Fresno. This is a predominantly Hispanic environment. I see a lot of brothers with Latinas, a lot of them. You know, I grew up in the Bay Area, saw a lot of brothers with Asian women. You know what I mean? It is what it is. It's, so it's not it's never been limited to white or black. Well, I won't say never, but it's not limited to white or black. It's a lot of different options, even if you're talking about brothers who are looking for different options within the borders of the United States. I don't know how to say it. No, it's OK. I mean, real. you know, because it's been, that's been happening for since the 60s. Well, right? you know. But a lot, for a long time, I don't know if I'll say this, I'll probably get in trouble. You know, I might have to have you help me later because I'm <laughs> saying things and they'll be all over the place. You back for a long time, counseling. you talk about Mariah's black. For a long time, she was too light. Mm. They didn't like her. Yeah. You know, she don't look like. You know what? Humans are crazy as hell. They Do are. you know that? They we are, are crazy we as are. hell. Just like me. <laughs> I never know what's going to set me off. Right. So we. Have I'll give her this. I ain't seen a lot of women talking, advocating for light skinned women. <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of that. And it ain't like there's a pile of money, you know, just catering to brothers. Let's put that on the table. Uh, it's not. It, 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 and I've been in this space for a number of years now. If you if you cater your content to black men, it doesn't generally pay a whole lot. You know, um, it pays more if you're a woman. I grant that if you're a man, you know, doing work for black men, the numbers are lower. You know, if you're a woman, more men will pay attention to her. So that is a reality. But usually the numbers don't compare to when you're catering to women or to white folk in general. That's where the pocket really gets filled, right? If you're catering to women or white folk. So if she's pandering to black men only, 
you know, she'll make more than the average brother doing that kind of work, but it's, it's going to be nowhere near what she used to do on, uh, on Oprah's network, that kind of thing. So if she's pandering, she's kind of hustling backward, but Hey, I'm not saying it ain't happening. It just still I have to, and I want to encourage us, invite us in this day and age to stop, to really reconsider the kind of change that we place on each other. We don't call it enslavement. Mm. A, and a, your opinion of me is a chain around my neck. Mm. Yep. Where's, where's the free will? Where's the choice? Right. Judgment. There are a lot of men of color out there with means who ain't doing nothing. Mm. Spend mm. their money on the pole. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And they sleep with black women. Right, right, right. And ain't doing nothing for the hundreds of thousands of young black boys that can't read mm. or the the children the hundreds of thousands of black children with food insecurity right, right here in america and they sleeping with everything black and that they want to and they doing nothing so right. let's have a big conversation yeah so I, I don't think it's for us to to question i don't think it's not anymore right. that's piscean era stuff yeah. especially when you live in an environment where black women interact interracially it's it's applauded and when black men do it it's denigrated that that kind of binary is ridiculous but she just mentioned you know the piscean versus the aquarian age and i just want to point out usually when people use that kind of astrological language when they start talking about the aquarian age they talk about it as the age of women right the age of 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 the, of, of things opening up and i just want to kind of clarify something um it in many respects has to do with the balance between masculine and feminine. And part of the problem we have in contemporary society is the idea of the masculine is already polluted. It's, it's a cancerous definition that does not speak to what is actually masculine. What is popularly considered masculine in, in mainstream culture is considered toxic and oppressive. That's not masculine. And again, going back to my last show, when I was talking about this new wave of films and media projects that are redefining the masculine, not based on new fantastical things that we've never seen, but based on, you know, tried and true performances and, and, and demonstrations of masculinity that we've been seeing for generations, but chose to ignore in this contemporary moment about what masculinity is. That's we're dealing with that. So, so as we're having these conversations about the rise of the feminine, it's in contrast to an idea about masculinity that's already flawed. And the funny thing about this new definition of femininity, especially you know, what's applauded in day-to-day, -day, you know, mainstream culture, it's really, you know, women imitating men, right? So you have this, this, this faulty notion of masculinity that's dismissed as evil and oppressive, but the solution is this notion of femininity that is mimicking the masculine, right? How many television shows and films have you watched where they introduce a female character and she comes in and on masculine terms dominates every male in the room? She outmans every male. She beats them up physically. She dominates them. She's more skilled. She's more intelligent. She's more capable. These are not principles related to the feminine. They're specifically using women and dominating men at principles and qualities related to masculinity. So both notions of masculine and feminine in today's moment is, is faulty. It's ridiculous. It's not tied to anything natural. So when she starts talking about the Aquarian age, how most people interpret that is the rise of the feminine, you know, the, you know, and this is one of the reasons I have the black sacred masculine on some of my shows where I show you men who are doing things that men have been doing for centuries, taking care of others, protecting, sacrificing. Those things aren't new, but they, they have been forgotten in regard to what we consider masculinity to be, right? So masculinity is faulty and femininity is masculine, but it's still tied to this, you know, this kind of one dimensional definition of masculinity. You know, when you watch these movies and TV shows and you see the kind of culture that's been promoted for women and girls since the late 1960s, especially in the 1980s and onward, it, it isn't about discovering and exploring femininity. It's about uh, replicating and, and outmanning men by masculine standard. So both of them are faulty. And we're having a gender war over these ideas and neither has anything to do with what masculinity and femininity has traditionally been and still is on a day-to-day -day level, even though it gets no fanfare. Shit is ridiculous. That's now we're in we're, the lines are blurred. 
Well, I think there's just some people that came before us that gave us the ability. I mean, like I, I came from under the schooling and, you know, may you rest in peace, but I got a chance to have many conversations with, you know, Harry Belafonte. Me too. You know. And, that was my ex-husband's mentor, yeah. Harry Belafonte. Yeah. It, I grew up with people like G2 Iusi, who it, most people don't even know who that is. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Uh, I was a 60s revolutionary baby, Black Panther, uh, uh, free lunch program. Right. All of that. And bread costs more today than it did back then. Mm. How come that can change and I can't? Mm. Oh, I heard that. But that's what I was saying. Like everybody from, you know, Mr. B to Sidney Poitier to so many individuals that did so much for our culture that I don't even get, you know, discussed now. Uh, when, but when, you know, we talk about but that's them. our job. We have to discuss them. Right. Uh, can I tell you a funny joke? Yes. Okay. So when was it? A couple of years ago when they had the um, anniversary of Roots. Mm. Now I grew up, you know, I saw it live. You know, right. you know, roots. <laughs> right. But so I, being the cultural grandmother that I am, gather all my grandchildren. To t now let me quickly say something. That was an important moment in terms of media because that's that was the that was the narrative that gave America an idea about slavery. Now you can disagree with it. You can agree with it. I'm indifferent, but that was a moment that really gave even white folks had a definition of slavery after visually watching roots. I mean, this was the first time in my life where I saw white stores and shops closed down and they put a sign up saying, went home to watch roots. It wasn't just black stores. People went in, in home to watch this narrative of one person's family line. Um, and that became the visual and, you know, remembered narrative about what slavery is. Unta Kente getting his foot cut off, Unta being whipped. These became, this became burned in the memory of America. So to this day, when people invoke the transatlantic slave trade, visually, you know, in, in, in terms of memory, most people refer to roots. That was a critical cultural moment. So it's important that she brought that up because that's where, you know, uh, most people get their, that memory and that idea from. Teens, the tweens and everything, pop some popcorn, we gonna watch Roots, mm. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna explain every little part, right. you know, with Kunta and everything. Well, one of my grandsons, <laughs> oh God, mm -hmm. he says to me, um, why are they on that boat? I, I said, what do you mean, why are they on the boat? He <laughs> said, why are they on that boat? Mm -hmm. um, I said, well, they're being captured from Africa and, and they're being enslaved. He said, well, why aren't they in the plane? <laughs> I said, don't tell nobody your last name is Van Zandt. <laughs> I have had students ask similar questions. Some, uh, and yes, some were black, but some were others and asked similar kinds of questions. Not that in particular, but there's a lot of people who don't really, you know, kind of have a sense of history. Um, and that's something that ends up impacting us, whether we know it or not. So it needs to be dealt with. <laughs> but it also speaks to the conversations that we need to have mm. with our young people. True. You know, I mean, I saved every movie. I've got Cooley High, I've got Roots, I've got all of these things on Culture. DVD yeah. because I want them to see that. Right. I've boys in the. Many of my longtime uh, supporters know that I've done the same with my son. You know, I grew up as a latchkey kid, a lot of TV. Um, you know, my sister and I did our homework, watched TV. That was the reality of most of our childhood. Um, so that being said, you know, I did the same thing she's talking about with my son. I saved a lot of, you know, the critical films and shows that I wanted to not only have him watch, but talk about as he was growing up. So, you know, I think uh, I don't think I'm alone in that, but it's definitely one of the things I did, too. Hood, yeah. uh, you know, every all of um, uh, the not the Friday movies, they say, but whatever it is, I've got them and, and I want them to see them any time. Jet magazine, yeah. my grandchildren. I've they never seen an Ebony magazine. They don't, they don't know what a Jet Beauty of the Week is. Right? Like. <laughs> and how long a Jet ma I got some from 78, because you know. Yeah, the, the Jet magazine used to be the truth. The Jet magazine used to be the truth. Jet just recycled itself. Yeah. But I want them to see that part of the culture. But that's my job. Right. That's your job, mm. that we can talk about it and support them in recognizing and understanding how did we get to the cancel culture? Right. What are some of the issues that resulted in that? And how are we going to stand in it and be different in it, particularly black men? Right. You know, I mean, I, I have friends who've been canceled because times have changed. Things have changed. Women have changed. Requirements have changed. Expectations have changed. And nobody told them in. Yeah. That was, I mean, that's why I created it. I've been canceled a few times. I know. <laughs> and, and in that, it's like, man, I, 
I need a safe space to be able to say whatever I want to say. And in with someone who can say, I Nick, you might went too far on that, or let me explain this, or or even just a safe space to be the man that I am. Because even in being the man that I am, he said, no one's told me the new rules. Right. <laughs> no, no one's told me what I can or can't say until it's too late. And right. then they're like, oh, you wasn't supposed to say that. And particularly for black men, again, I will say it, devalued, dehumanized, diminished, demeaned, dismissed, disheartened. Um, what is, why do we go for punishment as opposed to correction? Mm. Well, here's the thing too, though. I mean, they're talking about in terms of how black men should be treated. And this whole conversation about cancel culture, um, I'm more interested in how black men respond and deal with it. Um, I want us, and this is why for the years, for the longest, right? The whole reason I built this whole show was about creating a vocabulary so we could, we can articulate ourselves with clarity based on our own experiences, you know, as, as opposed to using conceptual language that comes from other experiences that don't, you know, really encompass what we, what we deal with. And so my thing is, you know, as opposed to just being canceled because you said some shit people don't like, I want us to be able to speak very full throatedly, you know, using the kinds of concepts and ideas that we need to, to explain our experience and doing so with an unbowed head, unbowed, right? That's really what I want to see us do. Not wait for others to tell us what we can talk about, but talk about concepts and terms and experiences on our terms, perceptions of world events, of, of various phenomena from our own standpoint and do so without blinking. Not here to tap dance to make others feel good. I'm talking about this because it's relevant to me. It's relevant to my, to my own black boys and men in particular. I want us to be able to speak along those lines. And at the same time, I want us to be able to be financially and, and, and materially in a position where we could do so and not have to worry about losing everything. But if we're going to take the risk of being, quote unquote, punished, as it were, for saying stuff that people don't like, can we at least do so on terms that, uh, re that come out of our experience and is based on solid data as opposed to feelings and stereotypes? Right. Those are those are the kind of standards I'm looking for. When I'm interested in seeing brothers stand up and in this last year, I got to say, I've seen more black men standing up uh, than I've seen in my life about things that used to be passed off against us and nobody would blink. Nobody would say anything about it. And I'm seeing brothers stand up and speak out way more than I ever have. And I can't tell you how much that makes me salute my brothers because there was a time we didn't do that. And we're starting to. And I'm happy to see it. I want that to continue. But I want to shift that conversation from just uh, you know, either us being punished or us being corrected by others. No, I want I want brothers to speak for themselves, regardless of whether or not others like it, including Van Zandt. Where is where is the correction unfolding? Where where's where's that happening? The true and repentance. Who's doing it? Huh? I said the true repentance. Right, because it's one atonement. Thing, atonement, which is what Minister Louis Farrakhan said at the Love Million it. Man Month, yeah. Million Man March. What is that now? Fifty-five years ago, yeah. he said you must long, atone. Yeah. <laughs> but no, no, that definitely, and I've you know I've had many uh, times to sit with the minister, and that that really is his message. Yes. you know the accountability, the atonement uh, of the black man, and to to understand who we are uh, in an unapologetic manner. And that's why even us sitting here talking about you know therapy and even me personally, the things that you know keep me up at night are the responsibilities of a man and where what what I'm allowed to do and what I'm no longer allowed to do. Well, I, allowed is that the? I, I mean, don't in this think society, it's allowed. In this society, but see, allowed. we've given people's opinions too much power. But even be, when oh. when people's opinions can now destroy your you, career, yeah, not just destroy your career, but destroy your household. Right. Where where now because of people's opinions, when you walk down the street or when you when you walk in the door, people are looking at you different. How did be, that happen? Because because you went viral or because or not even just a specific number because I'm not even you know discussing a public figure. I'm just talking about the things that we can no longer say, the things that we can no longer do because now it's considered toxic masculinity or now it's considered uh, uh, no, but toxic masculinity has really become somewhat like the term misogyny. It's become anything that a given woman doesn't like and, and can say and articulate in media. Um, and, and that that's where it's, it's used as a shaming tactic, sometimes completely indifferent from what the actual act is, that they're responding to is. So it's just become this empty concept that's that's be, that's used to punish uh, men in particular. But it often is used also as a deflection from what was actually stated. You know, now I'm not saying there's no such thing as misogyny. 
But I am saying that that term gets thrown around a lot to where it's used to deflect from, you know, people actually bringing something to the table worth reflecting on. And it's used to kind of obscure what was said. So if it's going to be used that way, then in many ways, I believe in treating it that way. It's not relevant to me just because somebody said it. What's the argument on the table? Non gentle parenting. <laughs> now it's considered, I, I can't even in, in, in public raise my voice towards my child, or I can't even uh, disagree in public because when now my entire career is taken from me because however the angle on the yeah. camera was, it New looked like I was being a little too aggressive. New form of slavery. Because the black man specifically, specifically. is yeah. society fears. Them. That's right. So anytime we're not operating with the status quo, we got to do away with it. I have a friend who, who talks about it in terms of the bee and the butterfly. You know, when people see a butterfly, oh, look at the butterfly, oh, the, mm, and when they see a bee, they immediately start, start swatting at it. And the black man is the bee mm. in the society. Uh, you know, whether you're talking uh, President Obama or, you know, Hootie and Tootie on the corner, right. who's just standing there talking because they were off today. Right. But immediately it's assumed that they're on the corner up to no good, right. you know? Uh, society does see. And again, even though it wasn't planned, those are the two brothers sitting in the, in the car that I showed you earlier today, doing nothing more than sitting. And from what we understand, just from that short exchange, they were employed black men sitting in a car that some random white person didn't think they should be sitting in. But they were deemed a threat simply because they were black male. That's real. And realistically, it's gendered. So even in the academy, when they start talking about gender and race, they seldom mean black and male. Right. Gender has become synonymous and has been since its inception, really, in the academy. It's been synonymous with feminine, with female, uh, maybe LGBT, rarely straight men. Right. Even though straight men have a gendered experience as well. So, again, what, you, what I showed you earlier, the clip we watched. That was a gendered and racial issue. It was not limited to one or the other. But often when that when those kind of situations are addressed, especially from within the academy, they're either ignored or they're treated as simply an act of racism. The gender component is irrelevant unless it applies to women and girls only. The black man, men of color, now y'all will be bypassed by the brown men really soon because you know they're poisoning the blood of America mm. and bringing in drugs and, and that's, craziness. That's what you they know say, right? Okay, so you know it's going to be them in a minute. So right. y'all will be off the hook. But again, where, how many children you have will go viral? Mm. I've been teaching people how to balance their mind and their heart for 35 years. I ain't never went viral. Mm. It's a level of, of nice. degradation. It's, a, it's like we go for the base, the lowest common denominator that just feeds the. Dis she went viral. She, what she's saying, I think there's a slight misunderstanding. Viral doesn't always have to mean negative. It just meant you, you, you know, people are talking about you like something you said or did is going around and people are talking about it. She kind of went viral when she made that statement not long ago that black women were out of order. She went viral there. She definitely went viral. Um. Uh, when she had her show and she had one particular episode where the mother, uh, these were, you know, there's, I think it was three grown daughters and it was an older mother and father and they were sitting there. They'd been divorced for years. The mother had accused the father of touching his own daughters. And, um, you know, finally, you know, they got her to admit that she lied. The mother lied about this and the daughters grew up believing that their father had done this, even though he hadn't, there was a clip of, Ayanla facilitating a discussion between the mother and father, trying to get her to apologize and then, you know, giving the father the option to accept it or not. And he didn't. He didn't accept it. And he was right to do so. Or he was a well within his rights to do so. Right. But she went viral kind of on that clip. So she's gone viral a number of times, but she's she's framing vi viral as a solely a negative thing, I think. Uh, but let's see if she expands her definition deceptive intelligence of our mind to make us think that I'm going to jump on this bandwagon and tear you down, jump on that bandwagon. Like I said, 35, 36 years I've been doing it. I ain't never went viral, ever, <laughs> about nothing. <laughs> We're going to change that today. How about healing <laughs> ancestral patterns yeah. that I've been teaching? And again, this is not about me going viral. This is about how this society, how the matrix of this society, with its predisposition to demean, diminish, devalue black men, has incorporated, has really kind of, uh, what's the word, recruited yeah. everybody to get into this thing where SWAT the bee. Yeah, I love that. This, I always called it the lion complex. 
If you saw a lion walking down the street, you gonna lock your door, you gonna call the police. No, no, first you gonna take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're you gonna lock your like, door. Then you're gonna lock your door. But you will be there trying to take a picture because it's something intriguing. But we were when taught you... to fear the lion because the lion got so much inside of him. But then, like, and we said this earlier, but nobody's ever checking on the lion. That's right. Nobody. No one ever asked how Mr. The lion, lion how you doing? Yeah. How you feel, Mr. Lion? They go they gonna trank a lot. And that's real talk. That's real talk. I know I I haven't asked this in a while, but I remember over a year ago I asked my listeners. I mean, how long has it been since somebody's called to check on you? And I was shocked to find out how many hadn't. So um, we can do that here. We can do that right now. Because what they're talking about is real at this current moment. This this part of the conversation. This is very real in terms of who supports you. Now, I can say in general that if you are considered the strong one in your family or in your household, people do not think to ask the strong one if he or she is okay. I do think in a general sense when it comes to the being the strong person, but specific to men, right? If you've been, if somebody has literally just called not to ask you for something, not to, not to cajole you to do something for them, but simply to ask you if you were okay or ask you how you're doing. And that was the sole purpose that they reached out to you, right? Give me a zero. If it hasn't happened, give me a one. If it has, if somebody has called you, or come to see you, shit, even better, come to see you, right? Either way, reached out to you solely for the purpose of checking up on you. You know, how many of you have gotten that in the last year versus not? So put a zero if you haven't, put a one if you have, right? And let's kind of see where things are. Already, it's already starting out bad. <laughs> CB, CBP film um, and Joe Herb got ones. I'm seeing a number of zeros. Uh, ghetto user, all right, good. Sincere, good. T8, good. But I'm seeing a lot of zeros too. Uh, Black Mind, Black Mind says one, but from men. Uh, DJ B side says one from a friend. That's it. Uh, series of zeros and ones. I mean, just at a glance, there's more ones than I expected, but there's still a lot more zeros than ones from what I can tell. See, it's still a frequent thing, right? Passport OG says one only from one person. So over the last year, how often is it that someone actually just calls to check on you? They don't have an ulterior mo motive. They're not trying to get something out of you, not trying to sell you nothing, not trying to get you to send them some money or help them out with something. And that's not necessarily, you know, a negative that people need help. I'm not suggesting that it can be. But I'm not suggesting it is. I'm just simply asking, when's the last time somebody just checked on you? Ghetto user says too many zeros is a shame. Yeah. See? I'm glad to see some of the ones because when I asked this question a while back, I don't think I saw very many at all. I might have only seen about one, but I'm starting to see more ones. And I'm hoping that that's a testament to brothers who are reaching out and trying to really establish different types of relationships right? that might be more fulfilling than they have been in the past. But we're still seeing a lot of zeros. And that's the reality. Of a lot of black men's lives. So if nothing else, we got to reach out to each other. Because who else is going to understand what you're dealing with better than you? Right. So, you know, I urge brothers, and this is what I said the last time I asked that question. I hope that we are at least doing that for one another. The people that call me to do that for the most part, especially over the last number of years, is is it's a it's a very small number of brothers who are in my circle. To do that on a regular basis. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for them because I've known years where I didn't have that. You know what I mean? Months would go by. My phone would only ring if it was a bill collector or, you know, something of that nature. But, you know, having true friends that are there for you. Here we go. Guys, they're going to shoot because they fear the line. But, you know, my son, who's a black man, um, said this to me one day, you know, we have these really in-depth debates, of course, because his mother is a Yama Van Zandt. So <laughs> we had this really in-depth debate. And he said to me, Ma, the lion, the king of the jungle, who, you know, he just talked about all of the attributes and how people look at the lion. He said, what is it, Ma, that would make an animal that majestic, mm. that grand, that sought after? What would make him cower in a cage 
to a human with a whip in the chair. Mm. What would make that majestic beast so diminish himself that a human with a whip in a chair could make it? I said, he lost the knowledge of himself. Mm. He forgot he was a lion. How uh, many black men walking around today feeling inadequate simply don't have the knowledge of themselves and they're so busy trying to live up to the standards that the matrix has set for them without it ever having said, how you doing? How you feel? What you need? And they're trying to conform, conform to other people's expectations, definitions. I, I, no wonder. <laughs> mm, that's powerful. Shall we pause there? <laughs> I mean, uh, this session in itself, I mean, we just began to unpack some powerful stuff. But Doc, I, I, I definitely, I definitely feel Okay, I'll stop it there. And now I haven't I haven't watched the second clip yet. To my knowledge, there's two. If there's another that I don't know about, uh, feel free to send it to me. Let me know about it. But um, I'll probably do the second one, and we'll go through that. Uh, and I might do that one cold. This one I did at least listen to uh, once um, or parts of it. Um, but I haven't seen. I haven't checked in on the other one at all. But um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of put that out there because there was a few things I thought were interesting, especially. Um, you know, to hear, uh, you know, Nick Cannon talking about his family, to hear her actually, you know, nudging him to allow himself to be himself, to express himself and not be worried about, uh, criticism. And really they were speaking in code because they were talking about criticism from black women. That's really the core of it. Um, so we gotta get to, we, you know, we gotta get to the point where that, that is not your driving concern. Um, and we want to get as many brothers to understand that they can live um, and actually, you know, find peace in their lives and not have it be dependent upon whether or not, you know, these women over here are, are agree with you or try to give you permission and, and get rid of all of that bullshit. But, we, you know, that's a process that we're engaging in because this is not a conversation we could have on a macro level a couple of decades ago. We're able to have it now. So let's do so. But like I said, I'm going to, I'll do the second part and I want to hear more about what you guys think. I want to hear more about, um, your perceptions of, you know, the interview, what did I miss? What are some things that you think should be brought up and dealt with? Um, you know, we might bring them up in the second one and have that conversation, you know, cause I'm, you know, I'm pretty, pretty sure the topic will be such that we can include that. So feel free to write your thoughts and concerns and your, and your interpretations in the comments. So, you know, we can continue and address this, um, you know, and go from there. And I might even do uh, a little bit of, of a panel in terms of watching it. So we'll see how that kind of works out. But I am interested in hearing your thoughts. I am interested in seeing, uh, you know, what we didn't what we didn't cover. And there might have been, you know, some more to this, something else that I overlooked. So please, uh, please make sure you share that. Right. Thank you. Uh oh, I don't know what that did anyway. Um, yeah. So I will holler at y'all soon. I appreciate the support. Peace.